You're listening to a podcast from the University of Manchester. The buzz has been recorded in lockdown, so we hope you'll forgive any issues with sound quality. June the 23rd is a very important day on the calendar for many of our colleagues because it's International Women in Engineering Day, launched in 2014 by the Women's Engineering Society with the aim of highlighting the work of women in engineering fields. So, can I ask you guys, what percentage of the UK's engineers are women, do you think? Difficult. Uh, I go for 20? Uh, 20. Yeah, I was going to say 20 as well. 20, 20, you're both wrong. It's actually only 12%. So, wow. It's very low. It is low. And another stat for you, though nearly half of girls aged between 11 and 14 would consider a career in engineering. But by the age of 16 to 18, this has dropped to just 25%. And then dropping again to 12% of women actually represented in that workforce. So this episode, I talked to engineering superstars, Professor Danielle George and Dr. Jessica Boland about their own journeys into the field and the work they're doing to encourage more girls to follow them. But first, myself, Joe and Natalie are going to talk about three engineering legends. So we're going to be on the timer again. We've each brought with us one of our engineering heroes that we're going to tell the other guys about. So who wants to go first? Anyone? I can go first, if that's okay, yeah. The floor is yours, Joe. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Gertrude Lillian Entwistle. Now, I have to admit that I hadn't actually heard of Entwistle until I came to do this research, and I'm not sure if many of us will have either, but I think that's why it's so important that her story is heard. So what became immediately clear from my research was that Entwistle has done lots and lots and she's also been the first person to do lots of these things so she was a manchester girl born in swinton in 1892 and she was an electrical engineer who broke down loads of barriers uh, in order to enjoy a long and successful career in fact she was the first british woman to retire from a complete career in industry as a professional engineer so that was 39 uninterrupted years Um, she studied at the University of Manchester from 1911 to 1914, but she actually studied physics to begin with under the famous Ernest Rutherford. Um, But during that time, she also started attending engineering classes as soon as females were allowed to do so. She actually failed her preliminary physics exam in 1914 and left the university without graduating. However, I think her story is a really good example of people pressing on despite setbacks and goes to show that with a shift in focus, it can be really beneficial for certain people. Um, So in 1915, she became the first female engineer to work for the company British Westinghouse. Uh, They were looking for female engineers to plug the gap left by male workers off fighting in World War I. Uh, Apparently, she was only allowed to enter the engineering works as long as she agreed not to wear any trap not to wear a pair of trousers. Seems a little strange today, but there you go. Uh, It's clear that she was a very busy and active person. At weekends, she worked as a nurse at a Red Cross hospital, helping with the war effort, uh, and in the week took evening classes at university. Uh, She wasn't married, and this meant she was able to keep her job after the war ended. The company didn't employ married women at the time, which again sounds mad today, but was commonplace back then. Um, And she worked mainly on the design of DC motors and then became a specialist working in exciters. Uh, She was also the first female student graduate and associate member of the Institution of Electrical Engineers. Uh, Even though at first, in the first meeting she attended, she was suspected of being a militant suffragette there only to cause trouble. (laughs) she wasn't (laughs) Uh, and this wasn't the only group she was involved in she was very active in quite a few so she was one of the founding members of the women's engineering society Uh, she was involved with the electrical association of women the british federation of university women the association of scientific workers trade union and was the first female member of the society of technical engineers so she did loads as you can tell and i think she's a real unsung hero Well, so I'm going to go next, Natalie, as you've bent the rules slightly um, (laughs) on your choice. So I'm going to go next. I'll just set 
the timer. Okay, so it's another Manchester hero, engineer, war hero, OBE. I am, of course, talking about none other than Beatrice Schilling. So Beatrice Schilling was born in 1909, and she was really quite a character, even as a child. At the age of 14, she bought a motorbike, which is pretty rock star. I think you'll agree. And she would spend ages tinkering with it and that's when her love affair with engineering really began in fact even at this age she was determined to become an engineer which wasn't a typical ambition for girls at the time she worked at an electrical engineering company and her employer encouraged her to study electrical engineering but her family wasn't so sure so i've actually heard a story that her dad was really against her going to university to study engineering until she was able to rewire and fix his faulty bedside lamp And then he changed his mind and said it was fine. So Beatrice studied electrical engineering at the Victoria University of Manchester, which is now the University of Manchester. And she was one of just two women on the course. And she also went on to study a master's in mechanical engineering. So after graduating, she joined the Royal Aircraft Establishment, which was just three years before the outbreak of World War II. So during this conflict, dogfights were a regular occurrence in the skies over Europe, but the British Air Force had a problem. So when the RAF Spitfires or Hurricanes were pitched into a hard nosedive, the negative G-force would flood the carburetor of the aircraft's engine and cause the engine to stall. So that meant um, that the Uh, German aircraft were able to outmaneuver the British planes because um, they had modern fuel injection engines. So they were able to get away by pulling these negative G maneuvers. But Beatrice came up with a simple but revolutionary invention, the RAE restrictor, which unfortunately um, is also known as Miss Schilling's orifice, which (laughs) (laughs) it's not the best name. Um, But this was a small metal donut-shaped disc that was fitted to the carburetor and it stopped the engines from flooding. So throughout this time, Beatrice was also racing motorbikes on the side and she would even beat professional riders, professional male riders, I should uh, add. And then following the war, she turned to racing cars and she even worked on um, the mechanic side for some Formula One vehicles. I'm sure you'll agree. And again, not run out of time. Um, Legend. Yeah, Beatrice Schilling. Let's see you beat that then, Natalie. Okay, so I've only slightly bent the rule by not including someone from Manchester. But instead, we're going to the glamorous world of Hollywood. So my engineer is Hedy Lamar. So she was a very, very glamorous um, Hollywood movie star um, on the silver screen. Um, And her work has helped develop the technology we use today. She was known, mainly known for being incredibly beautiful. Um, she was the inspiration for two cartoon beauties, Snow White and Catwoman. Wow. Um, and in the 1940s, uh, plastic, surgery pla- plastic surgery patients requested her profile more than anyone else. So she was born Hedwig Eva Kiesler in Vienna, Austria in 1914. And as a child, she was very interested in how things work and she was encouraged by her dad to, to play with uh, toys and try and figure out how they were made. But in 1933, she married an Austrian munitions dealer, Fritz Mandel, who wasn't a very nice man, had strong ties to Hitler and Mussolini. And he took um, Hedy along to his business meetings about wartime weaponry um, as his trophy wife. So she had to sit there looking beautiful. But Hedy's pretty clever and she uses the opportunity to learn all about weaponry and how it's made. In 1937, uh, she fled. She flees to London to escape Mandel and his abusive relationship. And she was introduced to the head of MGM Studios, who then took her to Hollywood to become an actress. Um, while she was in Hollywood, she happens to meet Howard Hughes, the famous pilot and businessman, who encouraged her desire for innovation by giving her equipment that she could use um, while she was acting. And she took, he took her on tours of airplane factories and introduced her to lots of different scientists. So the first thing she does is design a new airplane wing uh, based on the fastest birds in the world, which Howard Hughes went on to use. Um, and she then did lots of different innovations, such as an upgraded traffic light, um, a tablet that when dissolved in water makes a drink similar to Coca-Cola. 
but it's in 1940 that she comes up with her most famous invention. So she meets George Anfield, who's a music composer, at a dinner party. And they come up with an extraordinary new communication system used with the intention of guiding torpedoes to their targets in war. So their system involves the use of frequency hopping amongst radio waves, with the transmitter and receiver both hopping to new frequencies together, which does which doing so prevents the interception of the radio waves and therefore allows a torpedo to find its target. So they after, um, after they've created it, they get a patent and try and get military support for the invention because they want it, they want it to be oh, used during the war. Natalie. You've gone I, need to finish this sto- okay. I, I need to finish this story. You it's too finish. much. So Joe, the how honourable. US- <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So the US military rejects the invention. They say that she didn't have enough military experience and the patent actually expired before she could ever receive any money from it. So the technology that's in this patent today forms the basis for everything that we use. GPS, mobile phones, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. It's used by millions of people around the world. And it's estimated that if she'd have benefited from the patent today, it'd be worth about $30 billion. Whoa. Wow. And she didn't get a single penny. It's also worth noting that the patent expired in quite quickly um, in 1958, but actually it was used in the 90, 1962 Cuba Missile Crisis. Every single US ship on the blockade line had uh, torpedoes guided by frequency hopping system. Wow. So as, as quickly as 1962, after her patent had expired, her work was being used, but she was just known as a, a film star. She wasn't, and just too glamorous. She wasn't known as an invention. She didn't get any credit for it. Right. So Petty died in 2000. But thankfully, in 2014, she was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame and finally, finally got credit for her invention, even if she didn't get the $30 billion that she should have done. And that is Hayden Lamar. Wow. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah, I think you broke the word, <laughs> bent the rules twice there, but it was well worth Over it. Over I'm not a Manchester inventor, but she was, it was just too good a story not to tell you. Yeah. Definitely. And from from one starlet to another, it's a sad moment because we're saying goodbye to Natalie. This is her last podcast recording and she's no. off, to, off to pastures new. So um, just before you go, though, Natalie, what percentage of physics professors are women? Oh, no. This t- test. Is it sixteen? Uh, I'm afraid it's only six percent, and you have learned oh. nothing from your time <laughs> with us. Nothing at all. So close, though. So, well, I think we're going to miss you a lot. So definitely, yeah, oh, I'm definitely going to miss doing this podcast. But I will be subscribing and still downloading the episodes every single month. Thank you. I should hope so. Thank you. (laughs) So a few weeks ago, I sat down with Professor Danielle George to find out what made her fall in love with engineering. You've previously said that if science is asking why, then engineering is asking how. Is the how something that interested you when you were young? Yes, for sure. Um, I didn't know it was engineering at the time. So so I would always ask why, 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 like many children. And then, and I hadn't really realized it, but then I would always sort of follow it up with how. Oh, so how does that work? Not why does it work, but how, how does that work? And that sort of stayed with me throughout my education. I hadn't realized it, but all of the the choices I made in terms of projects were always practical. So I wouldn't, I, I never wanted to sit at the computer and reduce data to make, you know, the wonderful um, maps of, of the sky, of the universe. I wanted to help create, design the instrumentation that would ultimately lead to those wonderful maps of the universe. Um, and so everything I did was practical. So when I was at Jodwell Bank, when I did my MSc in, in radio astronomy, um, I asked for my, for my dissertation project, could I work with the engineers um, at Jodwell? And that, that was something very new because the engineers were not the academics. And so I wanted to do an engineering um, project. Uh, and 
and so we had to have sort of special arrangements for my uh, for my um, supervision to have a, an astronomer plus an engineer because I wanted to make the project very practical. So eventually, I realised that the how was the engineer in me, um, and and so the why is the scientist and the how is the engineer. But it took me quite a long time to to realise that. What was it that drew you to electronic engineering in particular? Yeah, so it was the um, the practical side of of all of the things I loved about astrophysics so it was the the how things work in terms of astronomy and and radio astronomy so how the telescopes work how can we improve it how can we make better maps of the sky of the universe um and and so as I got more into it, it was all about the electronic side of things. So it's um, the, the low noise amplifiers that I that I design now and my research team design now, um, it was all about the semiconductor, so the electronic side of it. Um, how can we improve that? And I really like the sort of technology transfer that happens as well between, once you get into electronic engineering, I do it primarily for, for radio astronomy, but actually, there is some great technology transfer into farming and the sort of e-agriculture side of things that you can take from radio astronomy into farming. Uh, you can do it into aerospace. So there's, that's what I really like is it's electronic engineering fundamentally at the heart of it, but it can transfer into different applications. Awesome. Um, which engineers inspire you today? So I think, I think there are some really interesting entrepreneurs and sort of tech people that are, are engineers at, at the heart and we need to get that across more so people who work in google people who work in facebook um dyson people who work at tesla you know all of these huge companies that we know of have got engineers at the heart of it and that's what is, is making them work but i think we need to also, look, what I'm really interested in at the moment is sort of looking into the past and seeing how many female engineers there have been in the past. And there are so many. Um, uh, I'm starting to look at, uh, could you do a day in the life, sort of, sort of a normal day, just using technology that women were involved in invi inventing or developing? And it's much easier than you think. Um, you know, windscreen wipers, uh, paper, um, even things like the coffee machine, chocolate chip cookies, ice cream makers, the dishwasher, uh, Kevlar, <laughs> which is not just for armor, but you know, for for cycling, for tennis, for you know, life rafts, for you know, so many different things. Women have been um, involved in in engineering, and so that sort of history side, I think, is really interesting. In um, sort of not not thinking that it's new. Um, women have been in engineering for a very long time. They've just been sort of almost like the voices that engineers have forgotten. And so I'd quite like to bring them to the forefront again. You see, I had no idea that a woman invented windscreen wipers, mm. and yet they made a movie about the man who invented intermittent windscreen wipers. See? Yeah. So yep. there we go. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> figures. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you hear this a lot, but um, women are notoriously underrepresented in the field of engineering. So just 12% of UK engineers are women. Mm. Why do you think this is? Um, I think it's a similar story to, to the sort of physical sciences. Uh, we see a lot more women in the life sciences than we do in the physical sciences. Um, within engineering, there is um, the perception that it's not creative. And it's so creative, so creative. Um, and we need really creative people. And the amount of people who I know who are engineers, who have a love of music or who are brilliant artists, you know, is incredible. So many of us either play an instrument or we draw or paint or, um, so it's so creative. But I think there is also a perception around engineering, that it's dirty, that it's hard hats, that it's overalls. And and many women get put off by that. Um, so so we need to sort of, again, that's another myth we sort of need to debunk is, is, 
it isn't all about that. Yeah, for sure, there are engineers that, that wear hard hats and, and get dirty and, and that's great and you know we should celebrate that. But there are also so many other engineers that that doesn't happen to as well. Um, and, and so I think there's this sort of public perception around engineers that we really need to work with everybody and that that is government that is media that is schools everybody needs to get on board with how diverse engineering is once we all get that message we'll get more women do you think engineering is something you can come to later in life yeah for sure um i mean i so i came to engineering um when i sort of started my career. So all throughout my education was very much um, the physical sciences. So I studied maths, physics, chemistry. I went to do astrophysics. I then studied radio astronomy. It wasn't until I started my first job that I, I started engineering um, in a sort of an official capacity. I guess I'd always been it, but hadn't quite realized it. Um, so, so from an education point of view, I came to it quite late. I had to do an awful lot of um, sort of crash courses because I'd missed many of the fundamentals. Um, but I know people who have studied, there's an awful lot of overlap between physics and engineering or, or certainly my kind of engineering, the sort of electronic engineering. Um, and they've come to it, you know, mid-career where they've, they've been um, sort of a researcher in physics or they've been um, you know, studying physics in, in some way as part of their job and then made that transfer into engineering. So I, th I think, uh, yes, there is. What I think we need to get better at as a sector, an engineering sector, is if people have moved away from engineering and want to get back into it, how do we help people do that? And I know quite a few people who've moved away from it for whatever reason. M many people have gone, let's say, into the finance uh, sector and done that, and then realized their passion is engineering. How do they come back into it? Um, and we need to think to help people come back into it as well. What do you think is um, the single biggest grand challenge um, for engineers to tackle right now? climate change i would say i guess that's a fairly obvious one but if anyone so i think there, there are two sets of people who are going to change um what's happening in terms of climate politicians and engineers and and we have to work together in in order to um to come up with the sort of engineering solutions for it, but also to help people come along on that journey with us. So every single person needs to feel that they have a vested interest in trying to, to change that. Um, and so we need politicians on board with that as well. But I would say climate change and the whole sort of, sort of sustainability agenda as well. On to our regular feature now, where we ask your kids to ask our scientists and engineers anything. This episode's kids' question comes from Mia, and I'll let her ask it herself. Why are there more men scientists than women scientists? We have plenty of replies to this great question. Eamon Kerrin says, because we've not always made sure that everyone gets a fair opportunity to be a scientist, we're getting better at trying to fix the problem. Help us by pursuing a science career. Us male, male scientists will benefit too, as science will make progress faster with better scientists. Great point. Meanwhile, Marcus Gersebeck says, because we need your generation to grow up and follow your curiosity. Never let anyone tell you that something isn't for you. There's loads of support for all curious minds, but this hasn't always been the case to the extent it is now. Meanwhile, Dr. Sarah Mohammed Qureshi says, Actually, Mia may be surprised to learn that scientists and people studying to be scientists across the University of Manchester prevent a fairly balanced mix of genders. Unfairly, though, TV, books and other media tend to show men as scientists, which is what makes it appear that mainly men do science. What do you think about that? And then Liam Marsh says, science tends to be a good gender balance, but engineering is still lagging behind, though it is making progress. Public image has been the problem, not ability. An engineer needs to be curious and good at solving problems. If this describes you, Mia, then you'll make a great engineer. I think that's a great point for this podcast as well. 
Claire Brown says it does depend on the field, but it also depends on how the business of academia is set up. There are a lot of women in my research group at Tyndale Manchester, which is fabulous to see. What is also great is the mix of ages and ethnicities, which is also important. Thanks for your great question, Mia. We'll have another kids question for you next episode. I recently spoke to Dr. Jessie Boland and asked her to tell me what excited her about engineering as a child. Can I ask first, how did you feel about engineering as a child and what about it excited you? Um, that's a really good question to start, actually, because I don't remember really knowing what engineering was as a child. So I think at school, I certainly had an image of like hard hats and concrete and the yellow viz jackets. So I don't think I had a love for engineering as a child because I certainly looked at the hard hats and went, nah, that's not for me. I don't want to be Bob the Builder. So I was obsessed with ballet right. as a child. So, yeah, I don't think actually as a child I really had a love for engineering, but was very much still asking questions. Brilliant. Um, you've, you've talked a lot about what engineers look like and you work hard to blast away those stereotypes. When did you know that you wanted to become an engineer? Not till very late in life. So I think I'm still working out if I want to become an engineer, even though I am one. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I kind of um, fell into it. So actually, my background was in physics. Um, but before that, I wanted to be a professional ballerina. Um, my mum encouraged me to have a backup. And I started studying languages, science, enjoyed maths. And then I kind of took the maths, went to more applied maths towards physics, and then just found that the type of physics I liked was an application. So what can I do in the real world? And I think it was only really uh, towards the end of an undergrad, end of a PhD, that I thought engineering is the thing for me, this kind of application in the real world of science and maths. And what drew you to electrical engineering in particular? Well, yeah, that's, that's quite uh, fun, actually, because when I was doing my PhD, my research was very much looking at nanomaterials. So really cool. I get to play with lasers and look at things that are too small that we can see. And these nanomaterials are really exciting candidates for new devices and kind of this challenge of trying to make devices smaller, faster, smarter. And that's something that we can all relate to because um, if you think about the mobile phone, how it's changed in a lifetime, some of us probably listening will remember when the mobile phone was the size of your head and it only made a phone call. Um, and now we have little computers in our hands and this was something that I quite enjoyed, this challenge of we always want smaller, faster, smarter, and more importantly, energy efficient nowadays. And those types of devices all fall into electrical engineering. So that's kind of what drew me towards that. I, I actually remember you doing a talk to some school children once and telling them that mobile phones used to only be used to make calls and there was a collective gasp around the room. <laughs> Such shocking <Annoying>. revelation. <laughs> Especially when they tell them it used to be the size of your head. They just can't imagine that. And then definitely I enjoy when there's other people in the room going, oh, yeah, I've still got one of those phones as well. So <laughs> It's quite funny. And are there any engineers who inspire you in your work today? Um, actually, some of the colleagues that I work with are inspiration for me today. So rather than kind of Mary Curie again, um, actually, the people that are tackling these problems now, these questions um, that I work with are massive inspirations. And I've been really fortunate to have quite um, some really good mentors throughout my career and they are inspiration for me watching them perform their research um, seeing them answer those questions and also how they inspire people to do research and science. So working in the UK today 
um, there only 12% of engineers are women. Why do you think this is? I think there's several reasons for it. Um, and probably the first reason is stereotypes. So from quite a young age, you have pink toys for girls, blue toys for boys. And there's already this kind of pressure from a young age about what it what it means to be a young girl or a young boy. And it's pressure on both sexes as well. And that kind of stereotyping goes throughout school. Um, and there was a really good study by the Institute of Physics that showed that all girls' schools are more likely to have girls studying physics or STEM-based subjects. So there seems to be this type of stereotyping as you go out through school as well that plays a role. I definitely think the idea of engineering as hard hats and concrete, which is something I personally felt as a child, um, also comes into play. So I'm not sure that many people realise that engineering can be so broad. I mean, playing with lasers is just one example of a type of engineering. Um, it's not just building a building. Um, there's several different types and it can look quite different. And I think uh, that kind of classical idea of engineering also plays a role. Uh, but I, thought, I think there's also another main reason, and that's that we have a leaky pipeline. So um, the number of 12%. If you look at type of professor level and senior level, the number of um, female engineers significantly drops off. And that's due to several reasons, such as childcare, maternity leave, overloading. But for some reason, they're being driven out, which means that you don't have those role models there. So I think we can all relate that if you're the only person in a room, that's quite frightening in some cases. It's not necessarily an inclusive feeling. And I think that also comes into play. So I think those are kind of the main two reasons. And, and another big question, sorry, but what do you think we can do to overturn this? Yeah, I wish I had a, a definite solution that I could say this is going to change. But I think there's several um, steps towards it to overturn it. I think there needs to be a lot done to get rid of these stereotypes. So encouraging anybody who's interested in pursuing engineering to do it. So that there's no reason for someone who says, yeah, I love engineering to not take up engineering. So I think we need to get rid of some of these stereotypes across the board. Um, so not just for women in engineering, but also it's uh, for men in language subjects. So get rid of any stereotypes. Anyone can study what they want. I think another small thing that we can do is stop talking about women in engineering and female engineers as well, um, because we are just engineers as well. So we need to make that normal. I don't think I've ever heard um, a male engineer be called a man in engineering. So just being given the title of engineering or physicist or scientist. And then I think we really, really need to solve the leaky pipeline first because um, there's a lot of focus on getting more women in our undergrad level, and that's important as well. But once we've got them into the subject, we need to keep them there. We don't need them dropping out. So I think we need to tackle that leaky pipeline. And I think some things that could help is dual career network, shared parental leave, making sure women aren't overloaded with admin roles, pastoral roles, for example, making sure that there's nothing in an institution that's stopping us being there and stopping us performing. Um, so I think there needs to be some kind of research done about the leaky pipeline as well. Um, and if we can have more role models, positive role models, then maybe that will help as well get more women into engineering at the start. So, Jesse, when we initially arranged this interview, it was a very different world only a few weeks ago. But now COVID-19 has changed life as we know it. 
what opportunities do you think this crisis presents to engineers? Does it does it present any opportunities to engineering? I think so, yes. So one of the main things that have come out from this is everybody is working from home, remote working. We've got more flexible working hours. And a lot of us have to juggle childcare, homeschooling, working from home. And I think that it's brought some of these issues to the surf surface. So some of these issues of juggling childcare is an issue that we face all the time. It's just been heightened um, significantly by COVID. Um, similarly, there are some engineers that cannot necessarily come into work every day, need to remote work for accessibility reasons. And COVID has brought that again to the forefront. So we've seen that in more detail and we've had to find ways around it. So I think one of the promising things that could come out of it is that remote working, working from home, flexible working practices um, are more acceptable and that will make engineering more inclusive. And if we're more inclusive and diverse, actually we're more successful as well. There's been several studies that have shown this, that if you have an inclusive, diverse community tackling these engineering problems, they're more successful. So I think that's one benefit that could come out from COVID. That's all for this episode of The Buzz, but we'll be back soon with a brand new episode. For further information on what you've heard today, visit our website at manchester.ac.uk forward slash The Buzz, where you'll also find links to all our social media. If you have any questions about today's episode, our email is fsemarketing at manchester.ac.uk. You can follow the faculty on Instagram and Twitter at UOMSIENG, and we also have a Facebook page and YouTube account. See you next time. Thank you.